Hi, folks. This is Abel James, and thanks so much for listening to Fat Burning Man, the show with a funny title that talks about cool health and lifestyle hacks that can get you real results. I am shocked and very happy to say that uh, my friend Tucker Max, New York Times bestselling author, has come on the show uh, this week. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that that you guys, the, a piece of feedback that I get often is that you guys really like uh, me keeping this show clean from language perspective and, and keeping our minds out of the gutter. Uh, I told Tucker that and told him to keep it clean. And of course, he acted like Tucker Max, which I appreciate. He's a good he's a good friend, like I said. But this show is much less clean than some of the other ones. Uh, it's more directed for guys. If you're uh, a woman, you'll also have some fun listening to it. But know that we bleeped out as much as we could, but there's still uh, a bit of Tucker Max in this particular show, obviously. So uh, before we get to that, let's uh, let's do review of the week. This one is from Kenny the Shark. Uh, and it's called Changed My Life. This show is the main reason for finally being able to take control of my health. It covers every aspect of a healthy life instead of just focusing on diet or exercise. Also, Abel interviews a variety of personalities to give the full spectrum on all his topics covered. Been listening for over a year, and I plan to keep listening. P.S. No commercials equals punk rock. I agree with you. One of the things, uh, you know, I do listen to some shows and podcasts. I don't watch much TV. The biggest reason for that is because of the commercials. And uh, one of the biggest reasons I stopped listening to other shows is because a lot of them are bought and paid for. So if I were hawking uh, a bunch of supplements or fat burning pills or random crap, uh, I think it would be more difficult to accept that uh, I'm trying to make this show as truthful as possible. And what I saw when I started uh, up Fat Burning Man was that you know, a lot of people are saying, hey, my diet works really well, but only if you take my pill. And so I didn't want that to happen. That said, I do, you know, I have a team that helps make this show possible. And so uh, it's important to me that that I do get some support for this show. And the way that uh, I'm trying to do that, I'm not really taking do donations, uh, but I did write a book. It's called The Wild Diet, and I, I do hope that you'll like it. It's uh, at Wild Diet Book. Dot com And basically, it's a cookbook of our best recipes uh, encapsulated by memoirs and stories of our life, basically, uh, <laughs> which includes everything from the beginning, growing up in the backwoods of New Hampshire and being healed by my mom on, on natural herbs and uh, basically Eastern practices as opposed to Western medicine, all the way up to, you know, selling our house and cars and everything else and traveling the world, checking out food in uh, Indonesia in uh, all sorts of different countries, up and down. We're just getting back from Peru, and it's <laughs> totally awesome to see how food affects people so differently in different cultures, uh, how we think about it differently, and how health is something that is uh, you know, almost automatic in other places, whereas we're in real trouble in the West. So uh, I hope you like The Wild Diet. Check it out at wilddietbook.com. All right, so who is Tucker Max? Well, Tucker's iconic first book, I Hope They Serve Beer in Hell, is a number one New York Times bestseller, spent five years on the bestseller list, and has over two million copies in print. This guy's a legend. It's ridiculous. He co-wrote and produced the movie based on his life and book, and was nominated to the Time Magazine 100 Most Influential List in 2009. Tucker is now a family man living in Austin with his wonderful wife, Veronica, and son, Bishop. Once again, I know you're used to uh, a clean, fat-burning man show. We did the best that we could on this one, but know that this show is a little bit stronger in the language department than others, so I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that. Now, in this show with Tucker, we talk about mating strategies for men, why most things men know about women are wrong, and the secret skill that can transform your dating and health life. All right, let's go hang out with Tucker. Hey, everyone. We're here with someone I'm honored to call a friend, Mr. Tucker Max. How's it going, man? What's going on, brother? I'm so glad to see you in your studio. Um, I haven't even asked you yet how you just started a family. Congratulations. Yes. How's yeah. your son, Bishop? He's doing very good. He's uh, he's already talking. Seven months old. He's already like, he can say hi and bye. Uh, he says those pretty consistently, and then everything else is kind of gibberish. But yeah, yeah, he's already blah 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 blah. Yeah, he's gonna get you in a lot of trouble, I think. <laughs> well, we'll see, man. It should be fun. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, 
You started a podcast and it's done uh -huh. fantastically well, which is no surprise. Tell us a little bit about what your focus is today, because I think a lot of people know you from your past. You're an incredible storyteller. You were certainly right. a hero um, when I went to school, someone that we all looked up to in, in kind of a rebel kind of way. So um, what are you up to these days as a, as a family man? And uh, and talking about male sexual health, right, right. So, so the uh, the big thing I'm doing that I think is probably going to be very interesting to your listeners is uh, Jeff, Dr. Jeffrey Miller, and I, who's a very famous uh, evolutionary psychologist. He wrote a, a book called The Mating Mind and a couple right. others, but that's his big fam famous one. He and I uh, sort of teamed up to write the definitive guide to sex and dating for young guys mm -hmm. uh, because we realized a couple years ago that nothing like that existed, and it seemed it seemed almost impossible to us. Like, how how does this not exist? And right. then, of course, of course, we realized, oh, right, we had to figure all this stuff out. There was yeah. no guide for this. And uh, so we got together and uh, started on the book um, uh, about a year or so ago, and it's basically finished now. We're literally in the – like, as I speak, we're in the final, final edits. Uh, and then we started about six months ago a podcast uh, figuring, you know, like – as we're we're talking about the book with each other, we might as well sort of start recording, and uh, it it kind of blew up and did really well. And then we added a Q and A to it, and now we have like uh, like four or five episodes a week, and you know, two million downloads I think in six months, something like that. Yeah. So if you're a dude who walks into a bar, what are you struggling with without even knowing it from like a biological? Uh, okay, basis? that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. We explain this to guys, and I, it blew my mind how much guys didn't understand this. Yeah. Because I guess I've just learned it; it's just become so uh, ingrained in me. So, all right, when you walk into a bar, there's about ten things a woman sees and assesses in a in a really under a second. One about a third of a second to about thirty seconds mm. um, is all it takes for a woman to assess you and basically make up eighty to a hundred percent of her mind. Yeah. Whether she's even going to be attracted to you, this is before you say a word. Right before you say a word, um, she's basically made up her mind whether you can even be attracted to each other. Mm -hmm. So, like when, and this isn't just a bar. This is anywhere, anywhere you meet a girl, coffee shop, CrossFit. I don't give a. Mm -hmm. shit. Uh, this is exactly how it works. So you walk into her line of sight. First thing she sees is size. Number one is size. Why? Because size is a proxy for threat assessment in the animal mm -hmm. kingdom. So deep in her mammalian, reptilian brain actually, size is first. Yeah. Then shape, right? Is it human? Is it dog? Is it car? Right? So size and shape instantaneously. Uh, from there, she's looking at – and then uh, – so like, well, let me not, let me make it really, like, I'll, time, yeah. I'll, yeah, I'll reduce it down to make it really simple. Size and shape are first, then, uh, sex, then, uh, uh, sort of, uh, race, uh, then accoutrements, then comes race and sort of whatever. She's looking at what you have on, uh, your accessories. Uh, she's looking at your body, body language, the way you walk, the way you hold yourself, which is really actually before sex. And that's really with size and shape and body mm -hmm. language. Because that tells her immediately, this is a man, this is how confident he is, this is how shape in shape he is, this is how fit he is, this is, you know, any a huge amount of information just from size, shape, uh, uh, gait, et cetera, right? How you walk, how you how you move. Then then all the other stuff, accoutrements, what you put on, your race, your age, all that kind of stuff. And so she's already figured out if she could even potentially be attracted before she even talks to you. Before she talks to you, and 80 to 90% of the time, you're automatically done. Automatically out. Yeah. So even if you're the right age, right, and you're the right sort of uh, situation, if she really is into um, guys who have their shit together and you've got ratty cargo shorts on and a tank top that mm -hmm. says like, Gut sun's out, guns out, <laughs> and a backwards hat, you're done dude you're out like you've got to have amazing yeah. game to go from there sure. uh with with that girl right mm -hmm. or a lot of especially guys our listeners are guys who don't even think about what they put on mm -hmm. like they're like guys who are and very most guys are like that right it's right <laughs> they just don't even think about it yeah. and and what, what we don't what we're trying to explain to guys is look everything about you is a signal you send to women about who you are mm -hmm. and they assess those signals and they make judgments of they make unconscious emotional attraction uh, decisions. 
based on those signals. Yeah. And most guys are pu- pushing, they're cutting themselves out of the game before they even talk to women. So many yeah. guys are like, tell me what to say to a woman. And I'll look at the dude and I'm like, it doesn't matter what you say, you're <laughs> <laughs> because you have greasy hair, your your teeth are disgusting, you've got dirty nails, you dress like a bum or you dress like a tool or you dress like a computer programmer or you dress like whatever and like you look at your shoes, you got velcro grandpa shoes on like <laughs> like you, I, there's nothing I can tell you to say because you're just so far behind the eight ball that every woman you approach is going to already c- exclude you from attraction right. immediately, which yeah. doesn't mean you have to look like me or, or they're fat. <laughs> if you're fat, dude, do you realize how hard it is to overcome that? Like if you're a fat, out of shape doofus, it's so hard. You can do it, man. Women, there. if you have an amazing personality mm-hmm. and you are really funny or really rich or whatever, there are ways to overcome that. But it is so hard to do that. And so just explaining the concept of signaling, mm-hmm. right, which is relatively new science. Only about the th- last 30 years or so, uh, science, scientists really understood not only how, pri- how primary and important signaling is, but how um, pervasive it is. How basically everything humans do is about signaling to other yeah. humans who and what we are, right. which is like a, that if any, any of your listeners have read Malcolm Gladwell's stuff, he, he calls it thin slicing, mm-hmm. right, which is a sort of a – when I what I just explained all this assessments that women make about you when they see you, it's all thin slicing, mm-hmm. right? And so, so then from there we kind of explain, okay, like then once a guy understands that that if you're fat, you don't have a chance. Now he knows why he has to get in shape. Yeah. It's not about like vanity. And why is so important, right? Because yes. most people don't talk about it, but you really, even if it does come from a dark place or an understanding that the world is rougher than you thought it was, having that why to be like, okay. Right. I can do this is really important. Yes. We, we don't spend a lot of time trying to convince you the world is fair. We yeah. tell you what the world is like right. and why it is that way. There, there's a reason women judge you on your looks mm-hmm. because your looks give them almost all the information they know. Mm-hmm. The idea that you get that advice all the time. Oh, uh, no, 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 don't, honey, don't, you don't, it doesn't matter what you look like. Uh, good people will judge you by who you are. That's <laughs> not because. Here's the thing, not because who you are doesn't matter. Yeah. Who you are as a person matters quite a bit. But the assumption there is, is what you look like is not part of who you are. That's yeah. ridiculous. That makes no sense. Of so course it is. It's unconscious. So even if you, if you are a good person and you try not to judge people, so much of that stuff has already happened in the first one third to 30 seconds, right? Whether you're male or female, it doesn't matter. Well, my favorite example is whenever someone says that, I say, okay, I'm going to go get a knife and come at, run at you with a knife. And then are you going to just judge me by who I am as a person? Mm-hmm. Well, no, that's different. No, it's not different. It's the same <laughs> thing. It is the exact same thing. Uh, everyone judges you by every piece of who you are mm-hmm. and you do it to everyone else. And we all do it because it's part of who we are biologically. That's how we get information is by the signals we send each other. Yeah. And how you cut your hair, how you shower, what clothes you put on, uh, what you look like. Those are all part of who you are. Those are yeah. all very important signals for who you are. And, it's and I'm not saying you have to look like me, right. but like understand that that's what everyone's judging you for. And they're doing it for a good reason. It's real information. Just like me running at you with a knife mm-hmm. is real information you need to know. <laughs> so is how fat I am. Yeah. One thing I got really into into when I was in college and then after that too as I navigated the the dating world was body language and the whole study of science of the physicality yes. of humans and yes. how much of this really does boil down to what just what you said threat level you know mm-hmm. we never really think about that especially in because social- we're men men yeah. don't ever think about it we only think about it with other men because women are not right. physical threats to us women are only social or emotional threats to us not physical so understanding a co-ed environment, which is pretty much everywhere on earth, necessitates that you have some grasp of that. So once you understand that, isn't, I mean, both of us are kind of like that the alpha male type personality can be very intimidating or whatever. Knowing that threat level is so important to everything, where does that leave someone like you? Um, it, it, hold on. Uh, it teaches me uh, a, a lot of things, actually. You know where it helped me personally? I didn't have a problem with women. Um, uh, I had a problem with business. Mm -hmm. And what I didn't realize was I would go into rooms or meetings and I would deal with people 
uh, with the assumption that they were just as confident and just as self-assured as I was. Mm -hmm. So like that's why I think when you and I met, we got along so well yeah. because like – it was like dealing with someone your same size. If you're both gorillas, <laughs> right, yeah. right? Like you got your harem, I got my harem. You we're the still same beat size. The crap out of me, though. I right? Feel comfortable saying, that. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, dude, I, you're smart enough. I, like you're not, you're not the type of guy to ever want to find out, right? right. Yeah, and yeah. so it's like, like okay, but, but like we weren't uh, like sort of we, we you. I was able to deal with you like a peer, yeah. and and so it like it was really easy, right? Um, and I deal with everyone like a peer. The problem is uh, I'm a lot bigger and more confident than most guys that I interact with. And I didn't really even realize that. And uh, and I think a lot of guys were very intimidated by that. Mm -hmm. and, and and also because, you know, the way I'm very direct, um, I'm very – I'm actually kind of confrontational yeah. the way I talk. Even though like you can change my mind easily. Like plenty of people argue with me all the time and and convince me, oh, you're right. I'm totally wrong. I'm gonna change my mind. And then I just change like that. You know, mm -hmm. like I have very strong opinions weekly held, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not sort of common. And so that combination, I think, of traits um made me very intimidating mm -hmm. to a lot of people, and I had no idea right. none yeah and, and it was funny it was like once i figured this out one of my friends was like oh yeah tucker you don't realize when you walk into a room you totally dominate it <laughs> and like all these dudes feel like less of themselves around you i'm like why would they feel that way like i'm not attacking these guys like most yeah. I, i'm not like i'm not trying to do that yeah i just project that anyway yeah. and once i understood that the world even right it's like it's building right. rapport it's it's a style of communication it's its own language really right exactly and once i understood that i was able to tone my um unconscious dominance behaviors down mm -hmm. and like so this weekend i went to a conference uh, launch festival uh which is like what calicanus is big thing and we uh, and i was like doing some stuff for my startup and dude I, it was the best conference i've ever been to in terms of connecting with people like i've always connected well with women mm -hmm. uh not always, but for a lot for as long as I can remember, ten years, fifteen years, connecting well with women has not been a problem. Connecting with men has actually been the problem, yeah. and it's a startup conference, right? So it's all dudes, <laughs> and um and uh, or tech tech startup, so it's all yeah, dudes. Yeah. And so I go, and it was like I actually had the best conference I've ever had in terms of like meeting cool people and 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 clicking with them and whatever. And I think the vast majority of the reason is exactly for what you just said. I learned how to how to stop unconsciously threatening other guys mm -hmm. um and then after, now it's like ah oh, man it was it was it was like a whole world opened up i was like man i've been preaching this <laughs> to dudes for months and now i applied it to myself in a different yeah. context yeah. and it worked it worked perfectly it's so cool i struggled with the same thing because i um I, you always think that you're just doing your thing like everyone's cool or whatever but uh i got the same piece of feedback that Someone said, like, you're so intimidating. A lot of people aren't even themselves around you. And I'm like, really? Yeah. Like, I had no idea. I'm just like an introvert who's like, I was a shy kid and we struggle with as much as anyone else. It's just, you're so in your own world a lot of the time. It, it takes that, uh, sometimes the excuse of science, sometimes the excuse of like looking into deep biology to understand so much more about yourself because your person, like just being a personality without understanding what that is is a risk. Yeah, and how it impacts other people. Yeah. Right. And it's it's irresponsible to not understand. It, it, well, it's not even it's irresponsible. It's just uh, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. I was doing the same thing uh, uh, to myself in business that, got, that most guys do with women, you know, and I didn't realize it uh, just because our default setting in our head is to assume – I forget, there's, a, there's, a, 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 there's a name for this. It's like a, um, a cognitive bias – but the default setting in our head is to assume everyone sees the same things we do, thinks the same things we do, and approaches the world the same thing, the same way we do, right? So if I'm in a, like a start a tech startup like a uh, thing, like I, I'm not a threat to any of these dudes, right? <laughs> like that's ridiculous. But but what I wasn't thinking about is that all of these guys saw me as, um, or a lot of them saw me as, the big, strong, confident cool guy who made fun of them in high school like that was right, right. that's the signal that i that i was sending out sort of and it was triggering that sort of uh that um it's not a stereotype it's a um like a paradigm a template it, 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 like a right uh, like that template in their head that that script right mm -hmm. and so they were like and then i have that like a kind of a dominant personality so uh, they they like 
they automatically hated me for mm-hmm. reasons, or not hated, but they like reacted that way against me um, for reasons that had nothing to do with me, right? Mm-hmm. So I had to almost essentially be sort of extra nice and extra accommodating and take less uh, um, less sort of dominant posture. And as soon as I did that, then it's like once they realize, once these dudes realize that I'm on their team and that I'm cool with them, then they love me. Then it's like, great, it's no problem. I mean, that's charisma. People think charisma is like some art. It's not. It's a science. Charisma is two things and two things only. It is um, it first ha- warmth and second um, uh, like uh, I don't want to call it power, uh, capability, mm-hmm. right? So. And when, when you meet everyone, so when you're past all the size, shape stuff, right? And let, let, let's think of it more in a business sense. Mm-hmm. It, it's easier. When you meet someone in a business sense, you're thinking two things. Uh, does this person like me? What do they think about me? And are they capable? Are they effective? Can they get shit done? That's charisma. So if you, if you can display both things, because the two things tend to trade off in people. Uh, if you are warm, you tend to be unpowerful. If you are powerful, you tend to be not warm. Mm-hmm. And so if you can display both, then you are extremely charismatic. The best example is Bill Clinton, who is the most charismatic person on earth. When you meet him, the dude is totally focused on you, totally mm-hmm. intense, totally listening, very open, right? Uh, and then when we- I was a little kid at a pig roast in in the middle of nowhere in New Hampshire, and he was... Like you said, you treat everyone as a peer. He huh? was like that to everyone. I was like six years old or something. But he like calibrates, that. though. Yeah. My problem is I'm treating them like me, not like a peer. <laughs> right. That's yes. where I was screwing up. Yeah. Clinton calibrates and treats them as a peer on their level. Mm-hmm. He reflects back to them who they are, yeah. right, in a very warm, open way. But at the same time, you know he's powerful, mm-hmm. right? He's a tall dude. He's well built. And yeah. he's the he's president. He's a big guy. Yeah, he's a big guy. And so like that's charisma is someone who can make someone feel uh, safe mm-hmm. and also protected. Safe like protected, that warmth right. of power. It's like right. That's charisma. They're on your team. Like the biggest guy. I was just, you know, Chaz, right? In Austin, Chaz Brandon. Brantham? Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> I know Chaz. He just emailed me. Literally, it popped up like 30 minutes ago. That's funny. Yeah. So I was just talking to him. We've been friends for a while, but like someone like that, you see him in a room. Actually, funny enough, like we were at Dominican Joe's in Austin, you know, right. and that was the place where I used to live next to it. I would write books there. I'd do my whole thing. And then there's him who looks like Thor, you know, just like stomping around his place. And it's right. like, who is this guy? And then I saw him at some like random paleo thing once. And I'm just like, you're right. here. Like, who are you, man? Yeah. Um, but when you see something like that in a room, it's either a huge, like you need to account for it. Even if you are a guy, certainly if you're on a, girl, a deep biological level. You, like, oh yeah. I, I hung out with him in the same room for like a year or two, just accounting for him, not knowing if he was a friend, not knowing if it was safe. You know what I mean? But like, as soon as it is cool, like that moment that you talked about before people come to with you, all of a sudden it's a friend and right. that person is on your side. Love of the fight. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah. Oh, everyone wants to have on their the side. Room. Right. Of course. <laughs> you yeah. Can do whatever you want when he's in there. <laughs> right. Dude, that's why I tell guys, I tell every guy, I'm like, uh, uh, you should do MMA or Brazilian Jiu Jitsu right. because uh, uh, being a lot trained in. I don't know that about you, right? Like, you're, you're a great it, fighter. Yeah. Well, no, I'm not great. I'm, I'm great uh, if you're untrained. Yeah, then, yeah, exactly. then I'm going to f you up. <laughs> if you're really trained, like, if, you're, if you fight in the UFC, I'm like, you know, right. I'm a sped. You're going to yeah, kill yeah. me. Um, no, no. Uh, I always tell guys to do MMA and jiu-jitsu because not – and they think because it, it because you can beat someone up, it makes you confident. No, mm-hmm. that's not why you should do it. You do it because um, what it does is it teach, it res- reduces your anxiety about threat mm-hmm. and because now you know you can handle threats, right? right? I mean like, like someone like Randy Couture. I know Randy really well. Like Randy can always – he can tear my arm off and beat me to death with it, right? right. But like <laughs> I'm – but I was – 10 times more anxious uh, around Randy uh, uh, like when I started than I am now yeah. because – and it's not just knowing him. Like just – you can replace him with anybody, Chaz, right? Mm-hmm. Um, like yeah, when I met Chaz, uh, at first I didn't know him. Yeah. Uh, and, right, same thing. <laughs> but like accounting <laughs> okay. for him, 
See, here's the thing. I didn't worry about accounting yeah. for the dude, right? Yeah. It was like, okay, it's a big dude. It's not like it raised no anxiety in me right. because sure. I know how to handle myself in situations, mm-hmm. right? And so that confidence uh, is, it, it's like the force, man. Jiu-jitsu is like the force. Yeah. You take it with you everywhere you go and it kind of becomes who you are. Mm-hmm. And it's really amazing. Even though like I never, I've never had to do put an arm bar, someone in an arm bar to a bar or something right. but like it, it just it changes how you see yourself it does. and for men i think it's really 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 um look man here's the thing every guy uh deep it deep in his brain if he's willing to admit it wants to know how he would do in a fight yeah totally and when you train jujitsu and mma you know how you do in a fight and here's what's crazy it doesn't even matter if you suck it right. doesn't it yeah. actually doesn't yeah it really doesn't but you know where you fit yeah. And that is something that is almost impossible to get anywhere else is clarity about where you fit. And, uh, and, and you take that with you out of the gym and it goes everywhere. And you're so I, – I can tell dudes when I meet them. I can tell the guys, oh, that guy trains. And I know immediately because you have a – not because they're big, not because they're strong. Plenty of guys who do are small. It's because they have this weird confidence, a calmness, it's a calmness. about them. Yeah, it totally is. Like mm-hmm. usually the guys who are, uh, that's why I say that you're great because you're at the level where you have that calmness no matter what the situation right. is. And you you have to earn that. You really, I didn't like, you earn it on the bats, much, man. Yeah, totally. And you get beat up along the way mm-hmm. a bunch of times. Right, but, right. Like but I didn't realize how much I learned in a dojo when I was a little kid getting my stupid purple belt, but right. like coming back and, and practicing a bunch of different kinds. Like I did Krav Maga in Austin for, uh, for over a year and that was so cool because you go from like your hard work day or whatever or like being yeah. in traffic and being ticked off and then someone's literally coming at you with a knife and it's hard yeah. to like it recalibrates yeah. everything in your head exactly exactly it's fantastic uh, <laughs> now let's talk about one more thing before we go because i think it's something else that people don't really know about you but you're i, I can personally say that you're an awesome cook and it's oh, kind yeah. of like this yeah. this cool little thing that you have can you talk about why that's important because i think it's another thing that especially guys miss out on I don't know if it's important. I think it's a skill that if you have any interest in, you should develop. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, th- I- I'm not going to sit here and say, if you don't have that skill, your life's ruined. That's not sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I grew up in the restaurant business. My family is restaurants. And so I've always, uh, whatever, I-, I haven't just naturally known how to cook. I just had a lot of uh, access to learn when yeah. I was young. Uh, well, here's what's cool about it is that, um, first off, it means you're, you can be healthier because if you cook for yourself, it's always healthier, always, uh, assuming that you, you know, you're not you know, buying your, your food out of, uh, like whatever from McDonald's from this, you know, you're not buying the the fries from McDonald's and then cooking them at your own house. Uh, <laughs> then you're going to be, you're going to be healthier. Sure. Uh, and also it's, uh, in terms of, uh, y- you can save money. There's a lot of sort of practical things, but I think it does two big things. One is it gives you a, a very reliable, very valuable skill to display to women. It's very attractive. Sure. A guy who can cook, even if you can only make like three dishes, yeah. uh, even if you only make one dish, it's better than nothing. And it's like, it's very cool. And it's very cool and very attractive on a primal level for yeah. women. The ability to cook. Like, like the ability to- families, cooking for each other. It's such a, like a primal yes. gift. Everyone to, is on the same level when you eat together. If you can take a, a dead body, body, I mean like of an animal, and process it uh, into something that is delicious to eat, mm-hmm. that is on a primal level extremely attractive to women. Uh, the other reason I think it's it's really cool is because it really teach you can learn so much about life and about uh, through cooking, like mm-hmm. whether it's nutrition or economics, like buying preparing food or efficiency, like the way to set up a kitchen or uh, process, learning how to follow directions or creativity, learning how to sort of sub ingredients in and out. Mm-hmm. Cooking, like if if you're a young dude listening to this and you're like, I want to pick an area and learn everything about it and have that be able to like be the way I see the world. Sort of like, you know, uh, the greatest samurai of all time said, uh, Musashi said, uh, through one thing you will learn 10,000, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I would actually recommend cooking would be in the top three. Um, Fighting would be in the top three, like MMA, Mm Jiu-Jitsu, cooking, and then I'm not sure what number three would be. Those would be one and two uh, because – um, first, also it's a skill. You, you yeah. can always get a job if that's what you want in that industry. And you can learn immense amounts about almost every part of the world if you can take stuff and turn it into food. Mm-hmm. That is, um, 
that's a way to see the world. Yeah, it really is. It's a beautiful thing. And it's uh, such a missed opportunity, I think, for a lot of people who grow up in America. Whereas you go to other places, you visit other cultures, and it's so ingrained, you know, like it's it's such a, it's a thing of pride. And I think also that's another thing that like, you don't see that much of but every once in a while you know it'll be like uncle jimbo's ribs or something like that that's just like the family favorite or whatever but mostly it's just like chain companies have marketed that too much and we're all just afraid of our food now but like yeah. when you learn how to cook it just flips everything on its head and it turns it into this great way to build confidence yeah if you know you can cook there's always something you can do there's yeah. always a place for you it's awesome cool so we're just about out of time tucker where can people find you now because you're everywhere but <laughs> yeah uh so if you care if, if the mating uh stuff was interesting to you just google uh mating grounds and then you can look at we have a podcast and a site that has everything um yeah i, I have like you know my old stuff is on tuckermax.com my new stuff's on tuckermax.me um, I don't know. It just kind of depends what you're looking for. Yeah, cool. Well, Tucker is uh, not only a great friend, but one of the best writers I know and certainly someone I look up to in that regard too. So if you uh, dig his storytelling and that sort of thing, I encourage you to to look at the whole portfolio library that you've you know, put together. And Neil's is really yeah. cool too. Like the, yeah. your other projects are just awesome. So He's a co-author on the Mating Grounds book. He's really the, if it had been Jeff and I, it would have been a disaster. Neil's <laughs> made that whole book. It's really good. It's really good because of him. Yeah. Cool, cool. So thank you for listening, everyone. Once again, this is Tucker Max and uh, we'll see you next time, man. Awesome, dude. Thank you, brother.